And it was almost like going from Technicolor to black and white, to film noir. <laughs> it was totally like that. You know, and I arrived there in the 70s. So it was a different London to where it is now. So it could be a footballer, it could be a local person who's, you know, who's working in the Medina, it could be somebody in high fashion. So I love the kind of high and low uh, to play around with that. So I always call it, you have to be a hustler. When I say a hustler, you have to hustle the art game. This is an empire. Stories of exceptional Arabs around the world and their journey to the top. So Hassan, I kind of want to start at the very beginning um, about how, how you grew up. I know you grew up on a co one of the coastal towns in Morocco, and I wonder if you could uh, begin with kind of telling me one of your earliest childhood memories, or at least uh, one that you think of when you think of your childhood. Um... <laughs> Well, so I was born in a place called Larache, which is north of, of Morocco. Uh, it's a small fishing town. Um, it was known for fish. Um, my memory, I would say, probably be, being barefooted by the sea because um, I housed then uh, back to the sea, basically. So my memory, I would say, it was the mainly the sea, playing football. Um, I suppose when you're a kid, you have that kind of freedom. If even if there's problems around you, you don't notice them. Uh, so I would definitely say it was that kind of freedom of being uh, by the by the sea. Yeah, and and that must have been a um, a little bit of a jarring change moving to London. Yeah, I always said, and I will say it again, it was almost like going from Technicolor to black and white to film noir. <laughs> it was totally like that. You know, and I arrived there in the seventies, so it was a different London to where it is now, uh, or different world. Um, it was difficult because having that freedom, uh, going at the age of 13, not speaking the language, uh, it was a bit depressing, a bit sad. But I think, you know, when you're young, you adjust quicker. Uh, so by the time I got to maybe 14, 15, I started to kind of get in the groove of, of London. Uh, so mm. but it, was, it was a big change. And why did your family decide to move to London? Uh, purely economy, you know, my dad went there in the 60s, you know, my, my parents, you know, can't, they, they can't read and write. In the 60s, it was easy for, um, uh, for foreign people to get contracts in London, in, uh, in the UK to do the horrible jobs, you know, you know like the sweepers, the bus drivers, the, the train workers. So if what the British didn't want to do, so it wasn't, it was easy to get a contract for work because there was so much work. So you had a lot of people coming from the Caribbean, late 50s. And then, you know, th there was a small wave of Moroccan community coming there. So my dad, I think his friend got him a contract. Um, and he went there, in, I think, in 1966. And at that time, they were, their idea was to go to work, save money, come back, p buy a piece of land and do well for their family. That was the, the idea. But all of them got stuck there and started to bring families there. And uh, in in London, basically the biggest community is from Larache because each person was mainly man going there would bring their cousin, friend. So one would bring ten, ten would be you know a hundred, a hundred would come a thousand, and it continued that way. So they lived in one room, shared the same food, you know, to save money because it was very very foreign in the sixties. You know, everything food wise, weather wise, language. Um, and then we sort of joined him in 1973. Yeah. And can you tell me more about what your parents did, your father and, and your mother? Uh, my dad worked as a cleaner. Um, I was very proud he worked in a place called Annabelle's, but he was a cleaner. Uh, and he worked in another place called The Club that was kind of the same type of, he was in, uh, I think, near Mayfair. And my mum worked in um, in um, a clean in the kitchen of a of a hotel. So basically, it was uh, horrible to say it was just horrible jobs. Yeah. And did you feel that as a kid? Did you, did you feel kind of the troubles of your parents? And did that yeah weigh on you? Yeah, I saw them struggling. I saw them doing trying to do good for themselves and their kids and family. Uh, but you know, they sort of had to give up so much to do that um, and to. You know, there was, you know, there's five, seven of us, if I include uh, mum and dad, Allah Um So it was trying to feed them, trying to, you know, so it was really, and then trying to come back to Morocco in the summer and stuff like that. 
So I saw them, you know, and I know they worked really hard uh, to get to the point. They reached their dream, which they bought a piece of land and built, you know, a house. Um, but yeah, it was a different struggle. Yeah. And so you grew up in a quite a big family with um, many siblings. I, I wonder, I feel like every sibling always has a reputation in the family. What was what was your reputation as a kid? Well, I was the oldest one, so I was the black sheep, the, you know, the, the break of the family, in a sense, to make it easy for my brothers and sisters. So I had to go through a lot, you know, obviously culture, ways uh, to kind of uh, be moving there as a teenager, trying to adjust there. Um, then you have this kind of uh, fight between yourself. When you're outside, you're a Londoner. When you're inside at home, you're a Moroccan. Uh, your family trying to keep it. It's more Moroccan than Morocco because they try and, you know, they, they you know, Morocco's moves on this time, you know, it, uh, as an evolution. But the people that go there, they still have that old way of thinking. They keep it the same. Uh, so they were, obviously they're trying to keep that family unit, um, you know, had al haram and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it was tough. It was tough for my mum, uh, uh, because, you know, I was the first boy starting to go out and, you know, uh, you know, smashly didn't you know doing some stuff uh, you know as a teenager and stuff like that um but yeah and then it made it a little bit easy for my sisters and brothers a long time <laughs> <laughs> it's true i know it i'm the youngest i didn't struggle at all actually when it came to going out <laughs> yeah um do you remember Hassan the first time that that you thought um i, I guess that you experienced art um or kind of decided to to lean towards towards art a little bit. Um, I mean, it was it wasn't something planned. Um, it was like a, a long journey to, for me to call myself an artist. It was a long journey. Um, it was kind of a accidental um, situation in the sense, you know, it's loved doing photography. I, was, I did so many different things in London, kind of creative, but I would never put my name onto it. Uh, I did shows, I used to do parties. I mean, I did lots. Um, then, you know, when I started doing photography, I was doing it because I love photography. And then one thing happened to another, I got introduced here and did a show and stuff like that. And I think t for me to answer your question, when I did the, my first show, I remember the, the gallerist was would introduce me to a client at dinner. You know, this is has an artist, my artist, the artist, and I would be literally turn around to again, Alexandra, I'm not an artist, because I didn't feel I was an artist at that point because I needed to <clears throat> to dig deep down to yeah. see what I have inside me, and it literally took me two or three years to feel comfortable with the word artist, and the best time for me uh, to use that name when I had to fill up the passport when it said occupation and it said artist. That was when I felt, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've reached in that kind of way. But it literally took me about to three years. Why? Why did it take you so long? Because, you know, uh, you have to remember, I'm, I'm coming from a situation of somebody didn't study art. You know, I have lots of friends of mine that are artists. So I saw them studying. I saw them learning the techniques, the history, and also... Uh, getting prepared to, when they leave studying, they're going to become an artist. So they've already sort of built themselves to be this person. Uh, with me, I had to learn as I went along. And I felt ashamed to say to my friend who study, I'm an artist before him, where he's been studying for five years or four years. But more than that, it was something to see if it was just a one-off thing, you know, it's just like, is it just a luck thing? You know, uh, is there something that happened that moment and nothing inside? So I put in me, see what I have inside me to, I suppose, to earn that name, in a sense. So it was really something to do with myself, you know, uh, to see if, if, if there was something real there or if there's something that just uh, a moment. Hmm. But but reaching up to the point where you were doing creative work and not putting your name to it, I, was was there an inception or even growing up where you were kind of leaning towards that or did you... You know, even as a child, were you kind of more, a little bit more artistic than your siblings? Um... Uh, I mean, I wasn't, as a, I wasn't an artistic person, but what I did was a lot of creative so stuff. So even by doing a party, I would find an empty space, so an old loft space, but then I had to redecorate to make people feel good in there. And then I had to put the music on for them and entertain them. And, you know, so, so that's creative even on one side. And then I started, uh, I, I had a, a store, a shop, 
that was doing streetwear in 1984 called Rap. And during this period of time, I started meeting lots of people that became friends. Um, so I started assistant styling in uh, fashion, in catwalk shows and magazines. My friend was doing music videos, so I worked, you know, doing location, uh, casting, food. Um, so I was doing that and then I was running the clubs and then I started doing some art shows in my shop. So this was really a learning process. Meanwhile, I had the love taking pictures. I was taking pictures for myself, not, not to have a plan with it. But that really came handy later on when I started becoming an artist. I can use all that in my, um, you know, in my, in my situation with art because uh, for me to take a picture, I buy the fabric and I make the design. That really came from the shop, having the shop and producing the shoot that came from when I was doing assistant styling, you know, produce the show. So without realising, that came handy for my work later on mm. so it was really a process of um of uh, a, a long journey to reach that point of have it full complete as, a, as an artist yeah and along the way Hassan I wonder growing up in the in the you know 70s and 80s of of London or at least being there I wonder if you faced any kind of challenges by being Moroccan and, and an immigrant in London and likewise I think in your household did you get judged for being an artist because you know every Arab family you know like uh, doesn't like the word uh, artist <laughs> uh, well I think uh, to answer the first question yeah it was the 70s was very difficult being a foreigner for anybody not just me I mean uh, you know, from a Chinese kid, Indian, African, um, African, Caribbean. I happened to, my first friends were mainly from the Caribbean because it felt more comfortable to be with these friends because we had the same journey. There was different culture. We shared something in common. Um, so we had to stick together to protect each other in a sense, especially like 70s because 70s was quite racist, more, you know, quite racist in your face, or I call it naive racism. Somebody might come and touch your hair because they've never seen, you know, your hair like that and, you know, stuff like that, or the colour of skin of somebody. Uh, the 80s in London was more like the beginning of the melting pot. That's where really London started to change. So, you know, you have to remember the history of, of London. You had the 50s, 60s, the first generation of the parents come in, coming sometime with the babies that grew up in London. Then the first generation was born in the 60s, early 70s. So by the time the 80s, there was people there that felt they were part, they're Londoners because they're born there, grew up there, so they knew even if they're African or Chinese or Indian, this is their home. And so for us, it was very difficult to get work. It was very difficult to go to a place to dance or listen to music. Uh, so all of a sudden, all my friends started to do things. I was running clubs, so I was putting music for what we want to listen to. My other friend was a chef, he was doing food. Another friend of mine was a fashion designer, one was a filmmaker, one was a camera. So then we started working together. You know, if I need a camera person, I'll call my friend. If uh, I'm doing a club and I need food, I'll call my, my friend. So that's when it's become that word, the melting pot in the 80s. Is really because of this period of time. It was like, it was... <laughs> I would say late 80s was a golden moment in London, you know, not not Britain. I'm talking about London. Um, yeah. So really that's the evolution where from there in the 90s, things start to happen, fashion, music, art, sports and stuff like that, where you can see you now the result of of this young, you know, the young generation are benefiting of some of that kind of journey. And and in in your household, how would how were your oh, parents yeah, or your siblings like reacting to you being an artist? Um, far away, it's another world, you know, um, just they don't own anything about art. I remember taking my mum, Lai Ahmed, to, to my show. <laughs> she walked in, she didn't even look at the pictures, she sat, had some tea, and said, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, she's win. And that was it. There was, and I, I liked her for that because it was, you know, it's not, it's, uh, you know, we, you know, you have to remember we're growing up in the sense having pictures on the wall is haram, you know, stuff like that. So so there's that kind of double standard you, you have to think about. Um, but really it wasn't something, um, it, it's something for them to understand. It was a really a, a world far away from them. Hmm. Um, do you remember the first time you picked up a camera? Um, not the first time. I remember 
I mean, I took pictures in the 80s. I had like a Polaroid and, you know, sort of throw cameras. But I would say the first time maybe to answer your question, I'm, I bought a camera of a friend of mine, Zach Ove, who's a, he's an artist. He was a photographer then, he's an artist now. Um, he was doing work as a photographer. So I bought one of his cameras um, and he taught me how to use it and a couple of other friends. And then the, my, I remember doing my first shoot where, you know, I called my cousin, I found, you know, dressed her up, done lighting. So that I will remember making the effort, you know, instead of just having the camera and shooting. So I will say that was probably 1989, something like that. And that was your kind of first uh, kind of staged in, in your current style kind of photograph? No, no that was really, uh, I dressed up my cousin, uh, you know, in, in the 80s, uh, photography was quite fashionable to use like gel colours, you know, like reddish, blue, you know, that 80s stuff. So I used that, uh, played with the brand with the lighting. And then after that, I started doing, I was more doing location shoot, to be honest with you. I had two African friends of mine that used to do capoeira, so I went to the British Museum and I thought, you know, they have the lion statues there and I thought, look, let's own the African, the, let's own the, the lions in the British Museum because they're both African. So I dressed them up, they posed for me in the British Museum with the lions and stuff like that. And so every now and then I would make an effort with a location, some friends and, and play around with it. But it wasn't regular, it was just sometimes. But mid nineties, that's when really I suppose I got possessed by just shooting lots uh, for you know for about seven years, not sharing the work, just really just shooting, uh, and that yeah. was between London uh, and Morocco. Yeah, um, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of your photography? Um, has it always? I often feel like when I look at your photographs, it's it's very. In some ways, it's activism and there's messaging around capitalism and branding. And, uh, you know, you're, you're constantly saying something, whether it has to do with capitalism or colonialism. And, and I wonder if you could talk about the evolution and um, where you've landed kind of today. Well, I think that was probably the journey of, of, uh, of what I was living, you know. So there was part of me being a Londoner and part, part of me being Moro Moroccan. And Morocco is... A, so-called Arab countries in Africa, North Africa. London is a middle, you know, it's a city in the middle of Europe and, and, and the rest of the world. So, you know, I had all these influences and that really came out of my work. You know, I grew up, for example, talking about capitalism, when I had my streetwear, it wasn't even called streetwear, the, the, the shop. You know, we were selling counterfeit T-shirts, Chanel Number no. 5, Gucci. This is like 1988, you know. 87, or getting a jean jacket and sewing, you know, like a, a brand on the on the back or something like that. Because we was kids in the 80s, uh, we wanted to be part of that rich, you know, accepted. And the brand, brand, I suppose, presented this of like, you know, if you made it, you have the, you know, the nice cashmere jumper and, you know, Prada trousers and stuff like that. But at the same time, they didn't design stuff for us. So that was really stuff that happened in the 80s and that came out in my work, you know, it just naturally came out of work. I wasn't thinking, I, I, I wouldn't go to Louis Vuitton and, and borrow a scarf to do a shoot with a woman wearing it as a veil. To me, it becomes like a fashion shoot. So I was aware of this and I'll use this for, my, for, for the strength of my work to communicate to people like myself. I'm, you know, I'm growing up in London when I was at school. It wasn't cool to be an artist before I met my friends when I had the store. You know, it was like a, a Ponzi. We say it's a Ponzi thing, you know. Uh, you, you know, when you go to a museum or a gallery on a school day, you hated that day because it's just boring. Um, so I was coming from this kind of background and, you know, I had to educate myself and learn and teach myself as well what's my strengths and my work. And I used all the stuff that worked for me that came naturally with that sort of question at that time, but there was subconsciously, there was, there was a, uh, uh, an idea behind of things. Like if I do this, I know I'm doing this, but maybe they can think of it that way because it's five women wearing camouflage, for example. But camouflage is fashionable in, in London that year, for example, but having five Arab women wearing it, it might look as terrorism, you know, so it's playing around with the mind of the people. So really stuff like that happened that way. And then the, you know, my rock stars was about my friends that are very talented. They don't get a look in and stuff like that. And, you know, because of having that influence of fashion, I started 
to make stuff and dressing up my friends and stuff about make dressing up making the cheapest fabrics from the markets and making it look grand so it's using all these you know it's like that word from you know negative transit to turn it into positive so it's a combination of all this really Mm, it's beautiful. I, I've heard you say that your your uh, art is not for the intellectuals. Yes, I mean, I think I'm, I probably did say that. I want it to be for everybody because I was one of those people that would feel uncomfortable to go in the gallery. I would never have gone to a gallery by myself, uh, you know, when I was younger. I would feel uncomfortable. I feel even I'm want, I, I'm wanted to walk in through the doors. And even if I walked through, I wouldn't even... Uh, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't know how to stand in front of a piece of work. I would just feel very aware of myself. So, you know, my work, I want it to be accessible. You know, I want it to be, uh, I want the people that look at it could look like somebody they know, you know, a cousin or somebody they know from Brooklyn or, you know, South Africa or Brazil and stuff like that. So the idea was really to communicate uh, another level, another layer of people like myself using all the experiences growing up, all the racism, stuff like that. So it's really presenting and documenting at the same time of, of these people. So, for example, the studio shoots I do, uh, my first experience with this was in Morocco when I was a kid, you know, where I had to dress up with my mum and my sisters in the 70s, like our best dress up and go to the local photographer studio and he would put the lights and the backdrop. He would have a picture taken and then you get a postcard size a few days later and he would send that to my dad in, in London because he, you know, he wanted to have a family picture. So it had that impact. But then growing up in London, you know, I was aware of Malik Sadibi and, and, and all these studio photographers. So when I decided to do this, I thought, well, anybody could really hang a, a cloth or something on the wall to take a picture, make it a studio, but what can you say with that? So I really wanted to use my designs, colorful, and play around with the framing to really make it, to keep that style of photography, but bring it to the new generation uh, and make it contemporary. So that was the challenge I, I used and, and tell a story with it. So it's an evolution. I want it to be an evolution from Melix and Deeb and stuff to continue because, you know, most people can, as I said, put uh, you know, a blanket on the wall and take a picture. But if it doesn't say anything, it just looks, uh, it's, it just looks a bit bland. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, bland is probably like the polar opposite uh, word to describe your photos. And uh, I, they are so full of color and patterns and um, they, they kind of... Um, they're, they're sometimes jarring in a way with how colorful and, and beautiful they are. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about color and how and how that has played into your work, but also why you chose to be so colorful in, in, in your work. Um, sorry, it was a So to be honest with you, like my early work was a lot more exterior work, uh, more cinematic, still using color. But with the, with the studio shoots, I wanted to really concentrate on the person. Uh, so having this person in, inside is kind of a splash, colourful world and clashing the colours but have harmony with, with the colours. So it really started with that. But I think saying that, when, um, you know, when I thought about this, I sort of, I think, what I said earlier on in the interview, when I went to England, I'm coming from a very bright, colourful place. You know, we wear, I don't know if you've been to Morocco, there's no scary, you can wear lime green jumper, you can wear any colour and it just sort of works, obviously, of, of, of the lighting here. And I remember in England, I still had bright clothes and my friends used to take, take, make fun of me, you know, like a bright green jumper, for example, and it's, you know, it's very dark there, so it just looks a bit odd. So I think... When I'm taking these kind of pictures, especially in London, at that moment, I'm sort of dressing up the person and hanging up the, you know, the the backdrop, the, the backdrops. And when I put that person inside that, you know, inside the set, let's say, at that moment, I'm inside it because all I'm looking at is that box of colour. So I call it escapism. It's probably me escape, escaping, escaping from sometime maybe you know the problems of the world and stuff like that so it really i think it has something to do with that as well yeah that's beautiful and and i wonder if like when you hassan if you could talk to especially 
for the artists that are listening or the photographers that are listening, if you could talk about the process of whether you're photographing Billie Eilish or someone on Skid Row, like what is the process that happens in your mind? Well, um, the process, I mean, I'll come to Billie Eilish, for example. So I think, you know, my personal work, if you come to my studio, you're going to see probably now I'm reaching in thousands of different outfits and props and backdrops and stuff like that. And it's really once I know who I'm shooting and I vibe with the person, he or she or they, then I start to work out uh, the outfits to present. And then once I know the outfits, I will work out the backdrop that will go against the outfits. Once the picture is taken, edited, then I will work out the frame and the and the, the products that go around the frame. So there's a few steps to to have the finished work. Uh, uh, coming to Billie Eilish, Vogue approached me. They wanted me to do, uh, to do a cover for Vogue magazine shooting Billie Eilish. So when I get to that to this situation, I have to look at it. it's a free. It's like a triangle. I've got to be happy, but more importantly, the artist I'm shooting's got to be happy, and then also the magazine who's employed me for this job, they got to be happy. So it's trying to make that happiness of three ways, if that makes sense. So it's different, but at the same time, I would shoot in the same way. You know, I would still treat Billy Ellis like the same as my friend in the Medina or something like that. Um, and then also get the opportunity to kind of get them to dress up in my stuff. Um, so really, to, and also to get that point, it really took all the people I've taken pictures of to get the attention of these kind of celebrities. Hmm. And and the people that you usually take pictures of, is it a conscious decision of who you want to photograph and how much of them do you insert into your work? Uh, you know, I'll let it happen naturally. You know, as my work got popular, I'm getting asked now quite a lot of people, you know, I'm getting DMs, you know, can you take a picture of me, this stuff, so I find it a bit funny. But really... Um, uh, the great thing is I have a whole list of people on the shoot. It's just not enough time. Uh, so it's to do with the vibing with the person. That's the first thing, you know, more, more importantly, because um, uh, it's not just about shooting anybody. So it's about either meeting person or if I'm a fan. And also, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, I've been very lucky in my journey to meet so many different types of people from all different parts of backgrounds. So it's nice for me to capture that because also it's showing my journey, you know, um, and documenting these types of people. So it could be a footballer, it could be a local person who's, you know, who's working in the Medina, it could be somebody in high fashion. So I love the kind of high and low uh, to play around with that. Yeah, yep. Uh, are there certain people that kind of stick in your mind that, that are still memorable or, or probably made the most impact on you, people that you think about still? Yeah, uh, I mean... There's too many, to be honest with you, and uh, each person's given me a story and a journey in my work. I mean, I've, I'm probably reaching, probably shoot, I've shot maybe about 5,000, 8,000 people. Uh, you know, I've only shown a very small body of the work, and every person I've shot, I look at them as being interesting and, uh, and in that kind of way. Um, but, I mean, there's... Uh, so, for example, when I came back, I think, from shooting Cardi B, you know, that was like a job. Um, a friend of mine was this with a band called Ko Ko Ko, uh, African band, and I got asked to shoot. Met them, and I was, you know, we uh, uh, came to a, to an idea to shoot them. So when I was shooting them, it made me realize I'd come back home after shooting, you know, like a celebrity. This was back home, so that made me happy to finish off the air that way. To to you know, because it was I think December when I shot them. Um, so there's moments like that. There's moments of. For example, I can look at a picture. Um, there's a picture called Cash Angels, for example. I can look at that and I know my journey because there's a, a group of girls wearing uh, different types of gelabas, different textiles. So there's like polka dot, uh, camouflage and animal print. And when I look at that, the camouflage I bought in Ludlow Street in New York, the fabric, the polka dot, uh, polka dot fabric I bought in Brick Lane in London and the animal print one I bought that in Marrakesh. And then it was made in Marrakesh. So when I look at that picture, there is an image taken, you know, a, a moment. It was like a year to get to that because I had to buy the fabric, bring it here, get the levers made. Um, so some some pictures, it's more, more, more personal um, uh, 
journey with them in a sense. Yeah. And, and how long does, does a photograph, I, I know maybe it depends on, on who you're photographing, but how long does that process take between uh, getting the fabric and staging and then the framing? Uh, so at the moment, so really I have so much outfits made now just to be prepared. Um, but so for example, there's a, a, a rapper called Tane, uh, he's, he's, he's half Moroccan, half um, West African, I can't remember where. Um, and I um, wanted to do shoot with him. So I went and bought, um, what do you call it, uh, flags from, um, I think Senegal, I think he's from, and Moroccan. And I made the suit, in like a patchwork suit with the two flags. So that suit would be especially for him. But most of the times now, I'm just designing and making stuff that, uh, you know, um, I don't have to make something specifically at that moment but then there is people if I you know if there's some interest or they have a vibe or a style about them or something they want to you know they, they're saying something then I try to match them up with something that I could do from a design point of view. Got it. Um, I think oftentimes when it comes to artists a big conversation is finances and how you you know, you go from being sometimes a struggling artist, which is, you know, the cliche of the struggling artist, to someone that actually is, you know, uh, photographing Cardi B or, or Billie Eilish. And I think for a lot of the artists listening, maybe you can talk a little bit about your, your journey with like money, really, because, you know, sometimes you need money to create more. And, and if, if you could talk about that process of, yeah, of just being able to make more money or ask for more money or your relationship with money... Well, I think if I'm, you know, then if there's some young artist listening, uh, first thing I would say, because I've, sometimes I get asked with some, uh, some younger generation, the first thing they would say, how did you, how did you make it? How did you become famous? How did you make money? Uh, you know, they, they want to make money and become famous. And I always say, if you go in with that attitude, it's the wrong attitude. You know, even if you make money and become famous, it might be not the right path because you might, she uh, needs so, uh, um, you might start making the wrong decision along the way because you're trying to make it. But if you let your art really take you on a journey and, you know, the richness about being rich is really about life of the journey that the art can take you on. You know, if you can make you travel, pay your rent, eat well, meet good people. For me, that's really the richness of, of the... of. Um, you know, being an artist. As far as money making, uh, it's one of the most difficult, um, you know, unless, you know, you have to remember there's thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of artists around the world that surviving on, on the arts, but we only know maybe the kind of big ones that have big names like the superstars. And there's only a small percentage of those. So if you can get managed to survive on it, at the beginning, you're doing very well. And my journey was really, I had to do so many other things while I was taking pictures and investing myself, you know, by buying the fabric, making stuff, having stuff ready. But also I had to take on other jobs. You know, I've been lucky where I can maybe design T-shirts and earn a bit of money of that. Uh, I've started to do commissions the last few years. That's that's really helped me up to kind of survive because because you might have a moment having a show and make decent money, but then you might not have anything for like six, seven, nine months, and you have to learn how to save that money to kind of um, you know to keep to bridge it to the next gig, let's say. So I always call it you have to be a hustler. When I say a hustler, you have to hustle the art game to be longevity, and to do that. You really have to uh, be kind of a, a person that be prepared not to do everything, but to kind of go off, uh, invest in your art, but you might have to do some other work on the side to kind of keep, you know, to, to get to that point of maybe it pays your wage and you're, you know, you're going. But it took a long time for me to say uh, to earn a wage because you have waves, you have like a gig, you make some money and then nothing's happening, as I said, for like, six months or a year and then you might do a show and it doesn't work do well you start to panic um so i've had to really do different stuff you know um and i'm happy if i can sell a t-shirt for 300 dirhams and i can sell a piece of work for 10,000 um, dirhams for me 
one is maybe is more profit and one, but for me, it's the same sweetness because you did it, you did it and you're, you're making it from that way. So it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's, you're the one that's feeding yourself and your team around you as well. So, so yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's something that you have to kind of learn to manage. Um, if you get that opportunity of making a bit of money from a show or doing a shoot or, you know, a commission and stuff like that and not spend it totally. Yeah. Is there something that um, keeps you along this path? Do you, have you ever wavered in saying like, oh, I, I don't know, art is just not for me or, or um, yeah, is there, is there something that is there like a vision or, or some mission? Yeah. I mean, I, I've been lucky because I'm, I do so many different things. I'm experiment, experimenting with film. One day I'm designing, one day I'm shooting. Some of day differs, which I've been really lucky. I think I always imagine if I was just like doing photography, 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 I might get bored, to be honest with you. Um, but having moments of going away from it and coming back to something else. So it's really, um, so what was the question? Sorry, I was going off there. If you've ever wavered, uh, uh, yeah, do, yeah, yeah, like sorry. thought about doing anything else? Yeah. No, I'm, I mean, I'm doing other stuff. Uh, while I'm doing art, yeah. um, so I'll do projects, I'll do installations, I'll do, you know, um, I just did like a, a, with a friend, like a, a concert here. So I'm, I'm doing other stuff. Um, but I think that maybe to answer your question, you know, when you're um, going in the world of art and there's, and you're in it for a long time, there is a, a moment of like, um, it's like any art in the sense if it's film, music, uh, <clears throat> uh, sports even and stuff like that. There's the artist, there's the artist that does the show and then there's like, you know, the galleries, the people that come, that socialise. This for me it becomes boring for me because <clears throat> there's people that just out there uh, to enjoy the limelight of of the opening of somebody or, you know, go and see a, a band and stuff like that. So that sometimes is, is off-putting because when you're doing that regular, you don't see your close friend, you don't see, and you become that because, you know, you have to go for these dinners and stuff like that. But as an artist, you have to go through this journey. It's part of it, sadly enough. Um, but then you have to learn how to, you know, not be in people's face all the time. Uh, to disappear sometimes go and work and then when you have something to show you have to do that so so that's the way I would probably explain this mm. um you know it's interesting to hear you s speak about your community and your friends and I can hear that you you value that time with them and one of the things that I found interesting when researching you was that you have this shop and you very often interact with people that come into the shop rather than just being solo in a studio working um is that something that you 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 do intentionally to to constantly, you know, be around other people or interact with them? Uh, no, I think it's just something that happened <laughs> from the beginning. You know, you have to remember I had a shop. There was always people there. I used to do clubs. So there was always people. I live in Camden Market, which is Camden. You know, it's a big market. So I live right inside the market. I worked in the market. I used to have a store there for like seven years in the high street. Uh, I live in the Medina of Marrakesh. They said the market. So it's somehow obviously i'm attracted to noise and people <laughs> uh, so this is something that's always been around and so i've always had a shop or a base open to public or people or friends to come by um so it's quite normal to me in a sense um you know and that's been going since 1981 you know so think of it you know 1981 i was in camden street selling flowers in the street uh you know for at, three, four years there. Um, and for me, that was a learning process as well. I had to deal with people, learn, you know, meeting interesting people. Um, so it's something that's not done on purpose. It's just something that's really maybe part of me. Mm. Is there any like advice anyone has given you that you often come back to and, and think is quite true? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, you know, when you're sort of so busy and you have a burnout, Nature is always good, um, you know. I've, you know, me personally, because I'm around so many people. A lot of people don't realise sometimes. You know, I spend time by myself because most people think I, I sleep and wake up with people. Uh, but I have to always fight for my quiet moments, 
And this is very important in a sense for, for everybody, not just an artist, just in general, especially it depends what kind of business you're doing or work or, you know, surroundings. Um, I mean, I would say probably, yeah, you know, normal stuff, you know, eating well, maybe going, doing some sports. I know it sounds a bit boring, but it's re really part of that, you know, nature, you know, forest, the sea, and now I'm going to sound like a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, no, the, the, I, I understand. But is there, uh, is there perhaps a piece of advice that I guess you would, you would tell other photographers or artists, like something that you would like to pass on? Well, I, I think the main thing, I said, it, I said it earlier on, I was saying, you know, for me, if somebody wants to do something to do with the arts is to really take off that kind of making it or becoming famous or making money. If you can take that away, and really just concentrate on what you love to do, which is art and create it. And, and I think also it's, it's a lot easier now for artists because you have things like, you know, you have a camera on your phone, you have, a, you know, a laptop and, and your mobile, you can make a film, you can do, you know, this, it's accessible. You have platforms, Instagram, you can show the work. So, I mean, really from where I'm coming from, excuse me, when I started, it was totally like, you know, you had the gallery, you show your work for a month. If 400 people come in that month, that's all going to see your work is the 400 people. Where now, you know, the same show for a month, you might get 5 million people seeing your work by somebody coming and clicking their camera and sharing it and somebody else sharing it. So really there's lots of pluses for the artists to do and it's really just get up and do it yourself in a sense, you know, um, and, you know, you can take a picture and delete where I was using film. You can do that, you know, <laughs> it was expensive. So it's using like all these kind of strengths uh, to really do your thing, basically. Yeah. And is that, is that a good thing? Do you think the role of social media has, uh, you know, perpetuated um, your work, for example, or do you have kind of critique about what the current, um, you know, online art scene is like? No, no, I think, you know, as I say, I, I'm coming from before the, social media, internet, and all this kind of stuff. So I've seen the evolution and I had to kind of go from there to, you know, to, to the world of uh, internet. And basically for me, it helped me because it highlighted, you know, I was probably showing like a good 10 years before, uh, before the internet really took off. So when the internet, the internet was sort of people getting into more, uh, you know, wife, uh, 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 social media, it helped my work. More people saw my work or discovered my work and got shared. So I, I, I welcome it because if you use it, if you, you know, I mean, as a person, if you overuse, you know, if you're on Instagram all the time and you're on, on the phone all the time, I think that's sad. You have to find a balance. Each each person depends what they do. Um, but I think you can really use it, you know, because I, I know some artists now where actually a gallery is like a dinosaur because it's different. Uh, it's a different way of thinking because now somebody can take pictures and have their Instagram as a gallery page, and somebody might hit them on that. And, a brand or somebody want to buy a picture. So they're also direct with the client. So they're cutting up all that middle person. Um, so I think I, I would definitely welcome it. It just, you know, it's like how to use it. You know, it's like if you love meat and you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner for five days or a month, you're going to get sick. <laughs> so it's find a balance <laughs> with everything. <laughs> uh. I like that analogy. Um, so r wrapping up a little bit, I, is there anything that you haven't done yet that you would uh, like to explore or something that you're looking forward to? Uh, no, really, just to be able to take time out and um, and go in my archive, you know, um, because I've, I was just shoot a lot and I never go and look at it. Uh, so that's one of the ideas I would love to do. As far as work, I mean, I, I, I've had so much more than what I could have jumped for, for, uh, for in a sense, you know, uh, I've never expected any of this stuff that's happened, happens, you know, to me in a sense along the journey. Uh, so I always think it can't, it can't, that's it, it can't get better than that. But I've been really lucky to be able to be still relevant uh, in a sense. And, you know, I'm not taking that for granted because, you know, artists have a window, you know, uh, like everybody, you know, like everybody else. Um, so for me at the moment, I'm keeping going, obviously, with the art to survive and, you know, because, you know, I have a small team and only, it's the only way I'm sort of surviving with, so I can't give that up. But really it'd be nice to kind of bit, um, uh, go under the radar for a minute 
to kind of just look at my work um, in, inshallah in a few years. Uh, but at the moment, I'm experimenting with filming. I just did a documentary, another documentary. So, you know, stuff like that. So I'm kind of uh, happy what I'm doing. Yeah. I like to ask this question, Hassan, because I, I don't know if you get asked it often, but, but what can we as the Arab uh, or African diaspora kind of do to support you and your kind of work? Like, what would you like of us, your audience? Say it again. What would you mean to support artists in the region, or well, or me? <laughs> how can we, as as people that are viewers of your art and fans of your work, how can we better support people like you or you, your art? Like, what do you also need from us as we get to enjoy your work? What What do you need from us, or what would you like from us? Uh, I mean, for me, I'm content. I'm happy. You know, with all the struggles it comes with. As I said, I never expected to to be what I've done in a sense. But I think to answer your question, in a sense, what you're doing right now as a platform, this is important not just for me, for other artists, but I think also for the artists to look within their uh, countries, within their, you know, they don't have to look at, outside all the time. And if, um, and if anything, artists need more help to do with... Um, space, materials, education, um, you know, stuff like that. Because, you know, if you look at, if you talk about Africa and, and the Arab region, there's so much talent in everything, in fashion, in music, in art. But we fall, we fall because we don't have sometimes the understanding from the older generation. We don't have enough spaces, uh, galleries. And if there are galleries that don't really, it's almost like the, the galleries are sort of, um, not understanding the younger generation. It's almost like a record label. It needs to be broken. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think it really is to do with like, with the community, with uh, with our own self to help each other in a sense. Um, and to do that, it needs, you know, some vision. Is that visionary people? <laughs> uh, from this generation to kind of, you know, like for example, I'll give you an example in Morocco, there's no Moroccan photography magazines, you know. One of my dreams, like, I'd be nice to do once a year, like a Moroccan photography book to just introduce it to people. It's a simple thing, but it's not easy to do because you still need finance and help and stuff like that. But just small things like that, more, you know, more spaces, more, more teaching, more, especially materials as well, because a lot of the time here, artists have great ideas, but don't have good materials to finish off the work to make it, you know, to, to that great finishing. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add that I haven't already asked you? Uh, no, I think you've asked more than what I was expecting. <laughs> I think it's enough. <laughs> Thank you. It's good. I, I've done my job then. Uh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it was a two-step.